Natasha, welcome to Conversation With. Great to be here. You're Malaysian. Did you vote in the elections? I absolutely did. And can you tell us what you voted? Well, I think, like most people I know in, in KL, I voted for Bakatan Harapan. Uh, I think that wasn't a huge surprise. Uh, very few people uh, who I know in, in KL uh, and, and other big cities um, voted for Barisan, and that has historically been the case with people I know. But that's not to say that there aren't a huge number of people out there who uh, who, who, who don't support Barisan, and I think this is something that, the, that the, the election victory, I think, has to take into account, that both huge political parties enjoy a lot of support. In the New York Times that you wrote a uh, commentary for the day after the mm. results of the election came out, you said that this was something that Malaysians could exalt over, that they had taken yeah. part in one of the most uh, you know, significant democratic events ever uh, in the country's history. Why did you say that? I think it's because it really felt like a truly momentous occasion. Um, no one really expected it to happen. People were very optimistic and very hopeful, but we have had our hopes dashed before. And although you know, most urban middle-class people, uh, such as myself and a lot of my, my friends, have always traditionally supported uh, the opposition, Outside of the cities, Barisan has always enjoyed huge amounts of support. And so, you know, with the government's money and the government's sort of wide support base, they were able to control so many things that affected the elections, as I mentioned in, in, in that op-ed for the New York Times, um, the redrawing of boundaries, uh, the huge amounts of money that, that went into their campaign really dwarfed what the opposition was capable of. So really no one thought it was going to happen and no one thought it was going to happen quite so decisively. What does it mean, though, for an author? I mean, why should we listen to you and what you think of the well, amazing election? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you know, this is one of those, those great questions. You know, writers get asked uh, an awful lot of things about, about politics. I guess, you know, if I were to defend my vocation, I, I, would, I would have to say that it's because writers think in terms of humans. Uh, we think in terms of, of intimate stories that affect human beings. Do you think that your novels ought to be more political? You do have always a political mm. element in it, but it doesn't appear to be the dominant element. In it. Let's say, take for example, your book, The Map of the Invisible mm. World, that's about uh, yeah. you know, all the upheavals in Indonesia uh, and uh, the political upheavals in the 1960s. But it doesn't even feel that prominent as the individual mm. storytelling of the persons and the sufferings they're going through, in other words, the human condition. Well, I think it, you know, it depends on how you, you define a political novel, you know, whether the, a political novel is um, about literally politicians uh, in the cabinet office, or whether it's to do with political issues like the experience of poverty, the experience of deprivation, the experience of marginalization, being an outsider, all of which are directly linked to the state of politics. And now if you look at the average, the way the average person experiences politics, it's much more to do with, as you, you mentioned earlier, putting food on the table. Can I put food on the table? Can I educate my children the way I want to educate them? Can I give them the choices that I think I should be giving them? And that's not necessarily going to be about um, what the cabinet office is going to be doing tomorrow. But it does, ha it's all linked, it does have a connection. You've lived in London though for most of your adult life now. After this election, has it made you think about moving back to Southeast Asia, to Kuala Lumpur? I've been thinking of a permanent move back for many years, not just now. I think um, my problem with moving back as a writer isn't going to change you know, with a political change in political regimes or, or without. Um, it's that I have a specific life in London, um, which is one that's not attached to any 
history or background. I can be completely anonymous. I can do whatever I want to do without the pressures of friends or family. Uh, you know, in KL, life is very, to me, quite familiar and, um, and quite comforting and reassuring in many ways. And I find that I'm not strong enough to break out of because I think I need a certain kind of restlessness as a writer. I need a certain sort of um, perspective on life as, as a writer. And you know, I think a lot of the things that I, I write about, um, or I have written about in my novels, for example, how um, the Asian family structure can be very nurturing, very supportive, but it, c it can also be very crushing and very damaging. And I need to have that experience uh, and that distance from my own family. I know this sounds cruel, but to be able to make pronouncements on even the most basic things, I think I need a little bit of distance. The red thread through many of your novels, though, is this Malaysian-ness mm. or the Malaysian storytelling or characters that there are. How much of all of that is autobiographical, come drawn from your own personal life? The red thread through many of your novels, though, is this Malaysian-ness mm. or the Malaysian uh, storytelling or characters that there are. How much of all of that is autobiographical, come drawn from your own personal life? Um, I guess a fair bit. I mean, it's, uh, it's, um, everything I write you know, eventually works its way back to the state of being Malaysian, um, a state of being... Uh, and I won't claim to be a typical Malaysian because I don't think there is a typical kind of Malaysian. People like to sort of shrink national s identities down to one particular form. My interest as a writer is in presenting the multiplicity of what it means to be, to be Malaysian, uh, which is why I think um, often people have difficulty location, uh, locating my characters as being fundamentally this or fundamentally that, because the truth is that we all occupy a space in between. Do you think you'd ever write a, a book which was totally not about anything Malaysian at all? Um, I, could, I could certainly sort of imagine that. Uh, you know, it's not... But with difficulty, uh, I see. With difficulty. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean every, try, every time I try and you know, set out to do something like that and to say, well, you know, this is going to be my science fiction novel or, you know, this is going to be my European novel, this is going to be my American novel. I mean, ultimately, it always leads back to Malaysia because it, it, it's to do with not actually being able to resist the ties uh, of home, uh, not being able to sort of resist what makes me who I am. Many of the characters in your novels are displaced persons mm. and the tension draws from the fact that they're trying to always fit in and find it very difficult to fit in. Do you intentionally create that tension also in your own life by living in London and by creating this sense of displacement? Uh, not consciously. And what I've noticed is that, um, is that when I was growing up, there was always this distinction between um, Malaysians overseas and Malaysians at home. Um, as are, I think, I guess, with every, every country. Um, or people who are in Malaysia physically, but obviously outsiders, like a lot of the, you know, the migrant workers now. But what I realized was that actually it was com very, very common to find people who had never left Malaysia, who had never left even their home state, who had never left really their home village or a small town, and who still felt like outsiders. Like they'd never, they'd spend their entire lives in a small town in the middle of Pera or Kelantan, and they still somehow felt out like they didn't really belong. And yet the whole world would look at them and say, well, they were classically and conventionally Malaysian, 
Some of your readers, of course, are completely crazy about you, but you also have those who are perhaps not as kind. Um, one good read, reviewer reader said that he thought your book, The Five Star uh, Billionaire, yeah. was like a bag of prawn crackers, uh, large uh, but light and insubstantial. What do you think when people criticize you like that? Well, I think you know, that's part and parcel of being a writer. And I think you know, if you try and do anything new as a writer, uh, then that is the, um, that's w the response you're going to get. Um, even if you, you try and not do anything new, that's the response you're going to get. I think you know, that's what makes writing you know, interesting. You don't know what, how people are going to, are going to react. Uh, and, and there is no formula for uh, what is a good book. Um, you and I you know, were talking earlier about the kind of books that we like and don't like. And, and you know, some of the greatest books I think ever written are books that you know, my closest friends detest. So, um, so there is always going to be a, 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 um, a divergence of, of opinion. I think I would be very worried if everyone uniformly loved my books. Um, it's not something I aspire to. I mean, my, my job as a writer is to write the book I, I feel most... But it's very polite, but wouldn't you really like everybody to love you? Actually, I wouldn't. Um, actually, I wouldn't. As a writer, as a person, I think that's something else. But, um, but as a writer, I think you, one wants one's books to sort of be talked about and to be discussed. Um, and one wants to be... And not necessarily always in a, in a flattering no, way? No, no, I mean, I think I would, be, I would be troubled. There would be something slightly wrong if everyone just really loved every single word I, I, I wrote. Um, there has to be some, you know, as a writer, one wants to get under the skin of the reader. And one wants to sort of provoke a certain kind of reaction. Even if that's irritation or, or disdain? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm not sure about prawn crackers, <laughs> but... Um, you know, it could be worse. Has your publisher ever, though, said to you, wouldn't it be better if you sort of move this ever so slightly, not massively, but move the story a little bit more to this way, so that our American readers would, you know, find oh. it easier to relate to it, oh, well, or, yeah. or that a British reader would find it more easier to rate it because subtext it would sell better. Yes, they, they always do, <laughs> but I think they've slightly given up now um, because they never, you know, their their efforts to. If it's that kind of change, I'm always very resistant. Um, you know, if it's sort of structural changes, editorial changes that actually make text better, I'm always sensitive to them. I, I can't say that I always follow them. But if it's that kind of criticism, then absolutely not. You know, I, 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 haven't, I don't think I've been at the receiving end of some of the more crass kind of editorial advice that I hear being talked about. You know, people saying, well, why can't we introduce an American love character? I haven't been, ever been the victim of that. Um, but, you know, I have had to listen to sort of some advice that, you know, I, I haven't really liked um, and that I don't think is constructive. That, I mean, I don't Can worry you name me one? Well, I think that, um, for example, my novels have always, ha have always had a slightly open-ended ending because I think that that's what real life is. You know, real life is full of relationships that we don't ever really get comfortable with. We don't get closure with. Um, for example, you know, you have an argument with your parents and then you have to get on the plane and, and, and then you're kind of it, all the time you're on the, pl on the plane, you've said something to your, to your, your dad or your mum said something to you and, and it really grates with you and, and you wish you'd said sorry or something. But the fact is you can't and then the moment's gone. And that passage, that chapter is open-ended. You, know, you break up with someone and that's meant to be a f to constitute an act of finality. But in fact, that relationship stays with you for a long time and you can't ever get comfortable with it. That's real life. So my novels have this kind of lack of closure. And I think people always, in, in publishing terms, like the idea of closure. We've got used, we've, got, we've become habituated to the Hollywood idea of of closure, the happy ending, ending, the happy ending, or even a not so happy ending, but which gives you a sense of satisfaction. But 
you know, to me, that sense of satisfaction always feels slightly artificial because real life isn't like that. It's full of relationships that, that keep going and going and stay with us. Um, when we get closure, that's the end of the story, and, and I know, I'm not sure that story is ever worth telling anymore. Um, so that's very typical of, <laughs> of what I, I the, get. The irritating, messy ending, but closer to real life, perhaps. I yeah. think so. I think, you know, we, there is a lot of satisfaction to be had from messy endings. You made your name, actually, being known as the Malaysian author who got the largest advance for any book, and that was 3.5 million ringgit. Is yeah. it true? Did you really get 3.5 million ringgit? You made your name, actually, being known as the Malaysian author who got the largest advance for any book, and that was 3.5 million ringgit. Is yeah. it true? Did you really get 3.5 uh, million ringgit? Um, no, is the answer. I think people are very obsessed by, by the amount of uh, the, the sums of money that were being talked about. You know, Asians, certainly at the time, you know, things have changed a lot. I mean, now there are a, a many more young Southeast Asian writers producing great works and are being published internationally. Um, but at the time, of that single deal for the Harmony Silk Factory changed the landscape of, of what Southeast Asians could do internationally. And so you know, people became, I think, slightly unhealthily um, fixated on the advance, which you know, obviously was a sizable advance, but nowhere near the, the levels that people were talking about. Do you make ends meet, though? I'm, I'm one of the lucky few who j you just about get, you know, gets by. Um, it's a tough climate to to operate in as a writer. I think no one does it because of money. Let's put it that way. I think I, I mean, that's very, very clear. No one goes into writing and no one sticks at it as a profession because they're interested in money. Um, my, the book I'm just finishing now, for example, has taken me six years to write. So no matter what I'm being paid for it, and you know, it's unlikely that I'm going to be paid huge amounts of money for it, um, it has to be divided by six in, term, you know, in terms of, of figuring out what I earn per year. And, and often for most writers, even very successful ones, um, they will earn less than probably a, a primary school teacher. And so I think, the, I think the reality is that you know, writers are in it because they have to write, because it's so fundamental to their being and they can't imagine being anything else. I mean, I have so many friends who are writers who are desperate to sort of change careers and become something else. But the fact is, you know, once you've been a writer for many years, it becomes so much part of you that it's very difficult to imagine anything else. If you were to give advice to your younger self, let's say when you were starting out, what sort of advice would it be? Um, <laughs> it's a very difficult question. Uh, the advice I tend to give to um, Younger writers just starting out now, not necessarily myself. I think I was, I was particularly foolhardy. You do a lot of teaching as well. I do do a lot of teaching. Um, is to know why you're writing. So I think a lot of people, certainly at the beginning stages of their career, are in love with the idea of being a writer, rather than being in love with the hard graft of, of actual writing. Because it's a tough job. It's a job like any other, which demands long hours, that demands sacrifices. Um, and I, for that reason, I've always tried to approach it the way anyone else approaches their, their day job, which might appear much less glamorous, but in fact is exactly the same as writing. There's nothing glamorous about writing. If I were to force you to give sort of one sentence, you said that you have to know why you write. Mm. So why does Tash Al write? Um, I write because I feel that I have, rightly or wrongly, um, stories to tell, that I have a particular point of view that I feel captures a sense of being Malaysian, being Malaysian of Chinese origin. That's important to me. Um, being someone who straddles cultures. I think, you know, if you're Malaysian, you're forced to straddle cultures. You're born with it. You're born with a kind of plurality built into your mentality. Um, 
And that produces a certain kind of interest, a certain fascination in the world, in the way that cultures intersect. Um, it makes you alert to the way people get left out of society. It makes you alert to the way societies develop. Um, and I think Malaysia as a country and Southeast Asia as a region is incredibly rich with these kinds of stories. And, that, and that's why I write. Tasha, thank you very much for having a conversation much, with me.